healing is not something that we do on our own ever. We have to include elements, air, oxygen, water, food, rest. We need a place to rest our heads. Everything is included in this symbiotic relationship called healing. My name is Alex Lewis, and you're listening to Words Matter, a podcast by Car Window Poetry. Every other Thursday, we invite you to hear from someone who's using words to make the world a better place. For our third launch day episode, I'm chatting with Knoxville, Tennessee's Dajay Morris. She's a singer, songwriter, and poet who, with her words, creates space for people to heal and connect. I'm really excited for you to hear Dajay's story, so without further ado, let's jump into it. Here's my conversation with Dajay Morris. All right, so I'm here with Dajay Morris. I'm super excited to be chatting with Dajay today. She is someone who I've been following along with for a good bit on Instagram, which is actually how I kind of learned about her. And now we're getting to be together on this podcast and have a conversation. So Dajay, say hello. Hello. (laughs) So Dajay, for people out there who maybe this is their first time hearing your name, getting to hear some of your story, who are you? I'm a singer, songwriter, and poet based out of Knoxville, Tennessee, and I live and breathe, (laughs) and I write. Well, how did you get started writing songs and poetry? Kind of what was your journey to that? Yeah, so I grew up in a really conservative household. It was so conservative that my parents decided to homeschool us, to keep us from being, air quotes, corrupted by the world. And so I would often spend a lot of time alone in my bedroom, didn't really have many friends as a 10-year-old, so I wrote poetry. I uh, started writing really bad poetry at first because I just didn't really know how I was feeling, but I had a lot of feelings to process, so I kept writing. And I still have those old journals. When I was 15, I got in contact with my biological sister, who I had never really had a conversation with before and she was also a songwriter and I hadn't yet started writing my first song I didn't people were like you can't sing like you need to stop just become a doctor do something else don't pursue the arts but my sister told me she said Daje you have you have this gift in your blood and I don't know if you know about it yet but I, I want you to start writing more And I want you to write songs and I want you to try it. How does it feel to get that kind of permission from someone who, you know, is so close to you? Yeah, I felt seen in a way that I had never been seen ever before. It felt like someone had opened a door to my heart that I didn't know was there. And they'd given me the key and said, now you know, and here you go. Will you go on your way? After she kind of gave you that permission of, hey, you need to you need to do this. What were next steps for you? Was it something that you like immediately jumped into or were you kind of hesitant at first? Yeah. As soon as we got off the phone, I sat down with my guitar that I learned, self-learned on, and I wrote my first song completely. And it was, I don't really know how to explain it. It it felt exactly as she said, it felt like it felt like a gift to me that I could find a secret world where my words and melody and this instrument existed and I could communicate my heart to no one at all really at first, but I could communicate what I was feeling. I know for me, like, you know, it's elementary school and I was first learning how to write, what to write, sentence structure, all that stuff. (laughs) For you, kind of like, what was that force that kind of pulled you towards writing or even just pulled you towards words in general, since that's something that exists in both poetry and songwriting? It's kind of hard to talk about that without talking about 
my family and my history with my family. So growing up in this conservative house, both of my parents worked, but my brother and I would often be left at home to do our schoolwork, which sounds a little odd. And it is, it was not, definitely not the best practice for homeschool teaching for an 11 year old. But there was this movie, so instead of doing sport, I would, <laughs> while my parents were gone, I would read books. I would, there was this movie that I had watched called Anne of Green Gables, and it became my favorite movie of all time. And I would sit down and I would read those books and I would read them over and over and over and over again. And Anne was a poet and she was a writer and she expressed herself through words. And I thought, you know, if she can find this much freedom being an orphan, which is, I was so dramatic that I often felt that way, orphan, alone. Don't tell my mom that. <laughs> I love her so much. But I thought if she could find this kind of freedom, Anne could through writing poetry and through writing about the things that were going on in her imagination, then maybe I could too. And so... I tried it and that's what kind of got me rolling. I, I've always been, I guess you, you could still probably go back further. I've been that kid who wants to document everything. And so I would take my Blue's Clues notebook as a yes. year old and I would go around and draw people's faces and try oh to tell gosh. stories. And so I guess you could say that it really started thin, but I didn't realize it until I saw Anne doing it fictional character that's doing so cool that was so life-giving but I wanted it mm, I love that that's I, I think that's really powerful like the the people the things the environments that become inspirational for us how do you find that your poetry and songwriting play together I'd imagine there's some there are some places where that style of writing overlaps, but also some places where they're different. Maybe it's in terms of how you communicate them or what feeling you want people to feel, but how do you tend to see your poetry and your songwriting coming together and in, in this beautiful way? Hmm. That's a, that's a great question. So a lot of the times when I'm performing or sharing my music in spaces, Poetry and songs are woven in and out. And so oftentimes, like, my poetry will assist me in my storytelling when I'm singing. So, like, I'll sing a song and then I'll share a poem right after that with the same, like, chord structure. It almost helps to, like, to bring an aroma to the music so that people are really, like, placed in the stories that I'm trying to tell if that answers your question. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I love that, that word aroma, like it's kind of this, I don't know. It, it has this sense to me, like an aroma, like fills a room. And so thinking yeah. about like how that poetry is songwriting, they come together to help fill a room and the impact of people who are there. I thought it was weird that I was doing it because I don't, I honestly don't know anyone else who is doing that. And when I find them, I will ask them to be my best friend so I can <laughs> learn from them. But I think, I don't know. I think like when you take, when you're taking in a story, you want it to fill your lungs and there's so many different layers to it. You can't give the whole story with just a song or with just a poem. You can't, get the whole progression with just, you know, that really cool, like, metaphor that you snuck in to the one line of the one poem that has a kind of a sick backbeat if you look for it. Like, it just, do you know what I'm saying? It just, yeah, yeah. It's it multifaceted, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't provide a complete picture. And even still, I struggle to find the complete picture with just music and storytelling. Sometimes visuals play a part. But I don't know. I'm just rambling at this point. Probably. No, I love it. No, it's, it's so good. And in your work, what roles do you find hope and wonder playing? Hmm. That's a great question. 
I think in the honesty, I read a quote the other day. I'm going to try to remember it. But it was something to the extent of where wonder doesn't exist, there's death. I could be saying it backwards, but without wonder, there's death. And so when I'm sharing my work and I'm being honest about very hard spaces and about very hard things like sexual assault, like divorce, like racism, which are topics that I talk about every time people come to my show. <laughs> Unfortunately, I hate, I hate to be a downer, but those are, those are things I talk about. They're real, yeah. It's there. There's also this very, very real and tangible sense of hope for me because here I am standing and I'm breathing and I'm not defeated. And the people that I get to tell stories about, tell their stories, they're not defeated either. And so let's imagine a better future and let's pursue it. Let, let's use the tools of songwriting and poetry and listening to discover a dream, to discover, you know, something that we might have made up in our heads, but it's totally possible. I think that's where healing is. I think healing and hope and wonder are all like a part of the same ball. When was the, when was the first time that you realized that the words you were sharing could be used to announce this hope, this wonder, the sense of healing in the world? I wrote a poem called Blackbird. So actually, back up. I wrote a poem called Coffee Shop Christian. Okay. And it was really, I've, I don't really share the poem anymore. I shared it on open mic and it was very uh, <laughs> potent. It was very exhortational. It called a lot of people out, you know, this idea of, you know, we want to change the world, but we're sitting in coffee shops and we're, we're ignoring each other, we're not doing anything, and we're ignoring a lot of issues. And so I shared it on open mic, and the person who's now like my poetry mentor, she saw me and she's like, I want you to come and share on this bigger platform called The Fifth Woman, where we share stories that have been silenced in women. And so she commissioned me in this little bitty time, a very, like, a month, <laughs> having very little spoken word writing experience to write five poems, five spoken word poems about this topic of, of hope and healing for women, but also from a very honest standpoint. And so I wrote a poem called Blackbird that was based off of a Nina Simone song, Blackbird, that basically it just kind of, it, it shifted my thinking in a lot of ways after I wrestled with that poem like I was in tears over that poem I was a week out from the show and still hadn't finished writing it and I was like I don't know how to do this like I don't know how to inspire people I don't know I feel like I'm, a, I'm an introvert you know I can't <laughs> I can't do this and I realized that it wasn't about me even though I was sharing my story and sharing pieces of the very real things that have happened that it was not about me because everyone in this poem, everyone is the blackbird, even guys, even guys find themselves hidden in this poem and find healing in it. It's not about, it's not about me. It's about, it's about what's happening around me and getting the opportunity to pay attention enough to communicate not only my heart, but other people's hearts so they can, so that we can all see our own hearts together, you know, and so that we can all feel honest and aware of what's going on inside of our hearts here together in this space, which is why we share. And so that we can all heal together. Healing is not something that we do on our own ever. We have to include elements, air, oxygen, water, food, rest we need a place to rest our heads everything is included in this symbiotic relationship called healing and so that's that moment of writing blackbird and not even knowing like really the power of words but having a sense of sense of it in some way that it could be important if i tried hard enough but 
I don't know. It's just, I don't know. I don't have any more words. But no, it's beautiful. Oh my gosh. I'm like, uh, I'm like trying to keep myself from screaming, but I don't want to like speak over you. But no, it's so good. And I know before we kind of got into this conversation, I asked you if you'd be willing to share a poem. Is Blackbird one that you'd be willing to share? Yeah, with people I would love to share that poem. Yeah, it has a singing part, so don't judge my singing. Why you wanna fly, Blackbird? You ain't ever gone, never fly. No place big enough for holding all the tears you go, never cry. Cause your mama's name was lonely, and your daddy's name was pain. And they call you little sorrow, cause you never love Okay. I could never find the end of the maze. I'm not even sure how I got here. All I know is that I had clipped wings, so I ran. I ran through the shadows. I ran around paths that were meant to be forgotten. I ran around the twist and the turns that shape-shifted into corridors that adjusted the temperamental mass inside that beats only sometimes. When it feels inspired and sometimes. When it remembers to love the taste of air. See, I have been running around this maze for years. I have planted my dreams upon its walls. I have longed to sing holy whispers to the wind, but the height of the walls have blocked my skin from breeze. It has shielded my heart from the rain and after the storms. My fists would soar through the darkness and beat at the bricks get out, only managing to grind up a frustrating mixture of blood, skin, and dirt, because sometimes all I'd wanted was to look free. As if this maze weren't wrapped around my unanswered questions that I still felt in my veins, like... Why did daddy leave? Where did mommy go when she was angry? Why did she get married again to a man who was insane? Why did he hit her? Why did he try to kill my brother? Why was he a children's mister? All I wanted were answers. So I clenched my fists and I beat at the walls thinking that all of my flailing could crumble them only to end up in the dirt in the dark with my fists crammed into my eyes like a two-year-old so frustrated that these walls wouldn't move how I wanted them to. The darkness brought chill to the neck hairs. They stood up and stretched my skin, felt the whispers of unfulfilled promises. Bones buzzed like they did when I had insomnia at 12. Knees trembled like they did when I had anxiety at 16. From the beginning, I had clipped wings, but clipped wings didn't stop me. I worked this maze. I put on my best shoes. I picked up my black wings and I strutted through these gardens, crushing truths before it even begun to grow. I knew bitter by her first name. I slept with anger in my bed and I accepted that the wind would never come and lift me out of this maze and the sun shone down on me in her hottest days. I knelt in the soil. I leaned my face against the coolness of the brick wall and I dreamed, yes, I dreamed. I dreamed of gentle breeze because the only time that the wind would ever come around was in the storm and I hated those, ran from those, never wanted to get my wings wet, never wanted to try and find the holy in this bad and what would the wind do if it found me? Would it lift me? Then I got caught. The wind did find me in the dirt and the dark, still dreaming of open skies. And it said to me, what do you think you're doing? Told me to get up, told me to get up off the ground, told me to stop whining, told me to open up my hands and learn how to receive, told me to stop complaining, told me to open up my wings, told me to listen to my lies and see if they made sense. I believe that I wasn't good enough for love. I believe that my dreams are too big to be feminine. I believe that I was still living with the fists of men. And he said to me, you are not the sum of your daddy issues and your scars. You are not the broken endings of promises. You are my rain catcher, my vagabond wanderer. You are my dream snatcher. And you can hold the stars in your palms if you want to. You can take off those shoes now. You don't need anything more than I gave you when you were born, my black. Open up those wings. We'll show them how far you fly with clipped wings, my blackbird. You will fly because you want to. These walls cannot hold you. Come on. That's so good. Dajay, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. That was beautiful. 
So good. Oh my gosh. Dang. I need a moment. (laughs) I'd love to move on to some of the stuff that you've been working on recently. So last year you released your first EP, the bloom project. Mm -hmm. Um, and that helped you earn some significant buzz in Nashville. Um, Nox. Saw on your website, <laughs> Knoxville. Oh my gosh, I'm so yeah, sorry. It's it's a you know slip of the tongue, but Knoxville's top 16 album slash EP releases of 2016. And that was from Knoxville Music uh, Warehouse, and then the 2016 Newcomer of the Year from Knoxville's Blank Newspaper. So, how would you describe the story that you sought to tell through the Bloom Project? Yeah, so the Bloom Project it was very timid. A very intimate project, but I wanted to eradicate my fear of being beautiful or being full of beauty. I wanted to discuss through the project some of the things that women, and specifically Christian women, experience but don't ever feel the freedom to talk about because of evangelicalism and the box that we've put all of our little bodies into and what we have to look like and what what we have to sound like as women. And I wanted to expand the feminine experience to include very complex truths that we all experience on a daily basis, like hatred and forgiveness and attraction which is not something that christian women like to talk about normalizing that normalizing the conversation that a conversation that we can have about abuse and physical abuse verbal abuse mental abuse in the home and i wanted to talk about mental health and wellness and why it's okay to lean in to healing and not okay to suppress the heart so yeah love that I think so important, so timely, even now. Those are conversations that are still um, happening. It seems like they're happening more and more. And so, yeah. Uh, and then you just had a book come out in September called "On Becoming Gold." And so, yeah. tell me, what's kind of the? This is a poetry book. So, the Bloom Project was a EP of your singing, songwriting, and so. On Becoming Gold is more of your poetry. Kind of what is the, what was kind of the transition that happened between the Bloom Project uh, and On Becoming Gold? Okay, sorry. I, yeah. Mm. On Becoming Gold is hard to talk about because it it is a direct product of my divorce. I was married for four years got married at 19 (laughs) and got divorced at 24, 23-ish. But it's a direct result of the mental shift that happened when I realized that my entire being didn't belong to anyone else, that, that I am my own person in a sense. And so it's, it's a book about my process of learning to step in to process. So for lack of a better, I don't yeah, really yeah, know yeah. how to explain it any other way. It's my process of learning how to step into being okay with process, being okay with not being perfect, being okay with not belonging to any one or being defined by any man or any other identifying voice that exists outside of this body and embracing my blackness, embracing my womanness, embracing all the things, all the textures that come with that. It's a messy book. It's very messy. It's full of a lot of really hard topics that were hard for me to write about. I mean, in the forward, I talk about how many of the poems I wrote on my apartment floor and it was right after I left my husband the first time and I was contemplating getting meds for panic disorder because so many things had been triggered by certain events and I I was (laughs) 
I was having panic disorders all day at work at my desk job, disassociating, having to step out several times throughout the day because I couldn't like couldn't breathe or couldn't see or it wasn't very dramatic. It was very quiet. I kept to myself about it, but just even those things. And so I, yeah, I wrote this, I wrote these poems from that place of really immense pain and turnover in my soul and in my body even. And so mostly convincing myself that, that life is worth living and that I'm not alone in the process of living it. And so, yeah. That's so powerful. Just even just those words that you shared is life is worth living and you're not alone. Those are words that through Carwin of poetry that whether it's me or people all over the world who are, you know, looking to share those same words with people. And I think we, we can never grow old of mm-hmm. hearing that this life, it has purpose, that we have purpose yeah. in this life, that, that there are people who are also going through similar things that we're going through. And so I commend you for being willing to put those words to paper. And as of recently, also getting to, you know, share those words out loud. Um, Mm -hmm. How has it, how has it felt after, you know, going through that, as you described it, this process of entering into this journey of healing, how has it been to actually get those words out and to share them with other people? How has that felt? internally what kind of response have you heard from people who have gotten to hear those words it's been terrifying um to say the least but it's been good and i feel a deep i feel deep gratitude whenever anyone texts me a picture of the book or like they tag me in something on instagram or I, and they, the poems that they land on, I always find very interesting. But it's been it's been a process of of hum, humbling for me and realizing even more so that this that none of this is about me, and that is a safe space for me to make art in. To be honest, but as far as the response is concerned, I think. I think people have been deeply encouraged by it. And I I think some of the words that I wrote, words that I needed to hear for myself, others have found that they've needed to hear them too, or read them rather. And yeah, it's, I don't know. I just, I guess it's been one of those things where people have, I've felt deeply connected with people and people have felt deeply connected with me over this very common struggle of learning that it's okay, it's okay, and it's going to be okay, and that this life is worth getting up the next day or trying and living it and showing up. I think that it's so powerful to hear how words, they can be this this vessel, this force of being able to remind each other of our humanity and our imperfection. And before we get into the final questions, Dajay, I just want to honor you for your bravery, your vulnerability to share your art. I know it is extremely difficult and it's a toiling process to go through and take those things that you are deeply processing through and living and experiencing and mm-hmm. probably not even fully understanding, and, you know, beginning to put those in words in the form of poetry or a song. And so I just want to honor you and thank you for just the, the beauty that you're bringing to this world and those of us in it. Thank you. That's so kind. Absolutely. So final two questions that I have for you. First one uh, just comes out of this belief that the things that we consume, the things that we take in, they help shape who we are. And so what are you consuming right now that you love? And it could be a book, it could be a movie, it could be, you know, your favorite type of coffee, like whatever that looks like. What are you, what are you consuming right now that you're really into? I... (laughs) 
I have been watching this Netflix series called The Get Down. Yes, <laughs> so good. Yes. Ugh, it's so good. I wrote my first rap on Monday. I love that. <laughs> it's not any good. <laughs> you want, you want bust a few rhymes? Like, do we, nope. we may have to extend the episode. I don't know. It might be a few years before I do that, but maybe. Um, That's awesome. I, I'm reading this book by Britt Bennett called The Mothers. I've been gobbling up fiction by contemporary Black authors lately, specifically women, and older authors like Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks are just like consuming. So I can't read enough of them. And then I'm also reading a book called Braving the Wilderness by Brene Brown. Yes, I need to read that. I keep like seeing photos of it and I'm like, Mm -hmm. it's good. First chapter. I'm on the first chapter right now. I just picked it up. So good. I love it. All right. Now I have some like I have some things to add to my list and I'm sure people who are listening do as well. So as we close today, Daje, where can people go to follow along with you and your work to find your find your songs, to find your poetry? Maybe if they want to come see you, where can people go to follow along with everything you're up to? Yeah, so I am, of course, on Instagram, and I'm also on Facebook. Both of those are Dajay Morris. I'm on Twitter as Dajay Morris. My website is dajaymorris.com. You can find all of the information in all of those spaces. As far as music is concerned, my music lives on Spotify and iTunes and Tidal and SoundCloud. And I'm releasing some new stuff very soon so be on the lookout for that poetry related stuff different vibe i'm excited about it but yeah awesome well daje will be sure to include that stuff in the podcast notes for this episode and i just want to say thank you thank you again for being willing to chat today and yeah uh, thanks for asking me yeah looking forward to continuing to follow along with your journey Today's episode was produced by me, Alex Lewis, and our awesome music was provided by Julius Tunstall. Check him out on Instagram at jtulius. That's J-T-U-L-I-U-S. If you enjoyed today's episode, I encourage you to leave us a five-star rating and review on your Apple Podcasts app. That's a huge way more people can learn about the show and be impacted by these conversations. I also encourage you to take a screenshot of you listening to this podcast and share it on your Instagram story. Together, let's prove that encouraging words and small acts of love can make a big difference in the lives of those around us. Until next time, you matter, you are enough. Remember these words when times get tough. Thanks for listening.